You started taking steroids to get huge, but something terribly odd has happened. You haven't gotten huge. Don't stress about it, man. We've all been there and I've been trying to figure this out for decades. In fact, I've worked with hundreds of clients at this point, getting them to get to a point where they can confidently say they've gotten huge. Today, what I want to walk you through is just how to get around the infinite loop of not making progress cycle after cycle. You clicked on this video because there is something personally holding you back. Got you, homie. Cycle after cycle, you've just maintained the same weight and you finally want to stop the fucking infinite loop of suck. <laughs> and if I don't cover your problem in this video, please comment down below. Give me other considerations. Maybe there's stuff I did forget, but let's get right into it. Starting off with the first thing that most people struggle to balance is just their health and doing cycles repeatedly obviously isn't good for your health. In fact, you might be struggling with it right now as you watch this video and you don't even know it. For example, many bodybuilders I know don't check their blood pressure, don't check their fasted blood glucose, don't even care about their resting heart rate, all of which you can do from the comfort of your own couch. I've made many videos and especially on our Discord, I talk about how to monitor your health in depth. However, I'll cover some general topics here. First of all, you're going to want to get labs about every 12 weeks if you're using any form of anabolic enhancements. You'll you want a CMP and a CBC as well as a GGT, obviously a high sensitivity C-reactive protein and ideally a urinalysis. Then you're going to also check your blood pressure on a weekly basis and then just make sure that we're not seeing any negative trends in your blood pressure. You're going to want to do this this first thing in the morning when you wake up and then middle of the day just about when you're most sort of active and getting and going kind of thing right that's going to be more of your general health assessment because if your blood pressure is low in the morning and then 90 percent of the day you're actually high you're just kind of screwing the pooch anyways during both measurements you should be nowhere near elevated somewhere around 120 to 70 80 diastolic is probably the best obviously there's not going to be days where you're hitting those numbers and i don't want you to freak out realize like hey if they're seeing a trend where multiple measurements are resulting in an elevated blood pressure, you may need to do something. Also wearing a device that monitors your resting heart rate is imperative. My aim is to keep it below at least 65 beats per minute with most clients, but I'm personally really aggressive and I don't settle for anything over 60 beats per minute at a resting state. Good job. You think about like a NASCAR, these things rev at a revolutions per minute of about 16,000 to 12,000. The engine in a NASCAR typically doesn't last more than the race itself. And sometimes in the race, they'll have to replace the engine in the car multiple times. While you have a Toyota Corolla, which can last for literally a million plus miles. And for you kilometer freakazoids out there, that's like 1.5 million kilometers or something. Probably not even close. Not even fucking close there, but we'll just call it good. You get the point. This is because the Toyota revolutions per minute in that engine is like 2,500 going at 60 miles an hour down the road. That engine's gonna last a lot longer because there's less frictions per minute in that engine as it's moving the car. Whereas the NASCAR has a copium of friction points that are just being constantly worn as the car is running. The heart is the same thing. It's a mechanical component of your body and as many times as it beats, unfortunately there's only a finite amount of those beats. So if you're beating really fast, you're really, <laughs> you're spending up a lot of the precious beats that you do have in your life. Next, you're gonna wanna get a glucometer measuring blood glucose about two to three times per week fasted. You're gonna wanna do this in the morning about after 12 hours of not eating, ideally. And then after certainly drinking about two to three glasses of water. Ideally, we want to be below sub uh, 90 milligrams per deciliter. And then in a perfect world where we know you're highly insulin sensitive and able to grow, you want to be around 80 to even below milligrams per deciliter. If any of these issues are off, you're certainly not going to grow effectively. And you should be doing more cardio, focusing on getting leaner and improving these health metrics prior to starting a cycle because you could start a cycle, not make any progress and get even more unhealthy because of these current issues. <sighs> Now, I'm really mad. Things like cleaning up the diet, focusing on micronutrients as opposed to just eating like garbage and again, doing cardio. These things will be imperative to you making progress on each cycle. And if you can figure them out, you might just get to that dreamer bulk you've always wanted, unless you get the wrong PED. You might think that because someone else got really great results on a particular protocol that you might as well, from that certain protocol, get just as good of results. However, this couldn't be further from the truth. Biologically and genomically speaking, we are, me and you, two very different human beings. Yes, we have the same genes that create a human, but as two different humans, the internal systems 
that we have quite substantially different. I might have more autism. <laughs> have more androgen receptors than you do and you might have more IGF-1 receptors than I do meaning that particularly you would respond to an elevated IGF-1 and I would respond to elevated androgens maybe you have very low androgen receptor density and so you taking a bunch of androgens just kind of makes a mute point when you could just be blasting growth hormone in a moderate amount of androgens. If you took all these fucking copious amounts of anabolic steroids, it would be like pissing vinegar in a bottle and then drinking it too. It gets you nowhere and ultimately you just have a fucking really sour face. Best way to do this is starting with the basics. And I made a video a while back on how to do your first cycle. So I recommend watching that if you're in the era of starting your first cycle. I don't know. Testosterone works the best. Then we add on to that testosterone once you're ready. We'll want to do this with a singular compound to determine your reaction to that specific compound. If you notice that one compound over another gives you a less than favorable result, then that compound is simply not going to be in use. You move on to the next one and keep trialing compounds that you feel like work exceptionally well for you. And how will you know that these compounds work exceptionally well? Well, let's just say it makes you feel great in bed, feel great at work, feel great in the gym, basically makes you feel great all day long. And you can do things that you normally couldn't do, not just in the gym, but in everywhere in life. When we're talking about work, your sex life, all of these things, it keeps you happy and healthy definitely keeps you in your relationship and doesn't push you away from your significant other. That is the one that you're going to want to stick with, not the compound that turns your dick into a flat tire and pushes you away from all of society to the brink of ostracization. You didn't have to cut me off. That is a word. I didn't make it up this time. It doesn't matter how much your friends swear by this one thing getting them all the gains in the world because there never is just one thing that gives you all of the gains. Just experiments, analyze, take notes, and educate yourself. And doing this will give you the knowledge and ammo to grow indefinitely and not just be the one friend who starts trend on his first cycle hoping for the best. Got it. <laughs> Speaking about bad cycles, this fucks so many people's progress. Have you ever spent hundreds of dollars just to get scammed or ripped off? Maybe even thousands of dollars? I know I did when I uh, bought into the idea of coming to Canada for some brilliant idea. And lost <laughs> much fucking uh. seriously though this happens a lot in the game of building muscle you purchase some compounds they arrive at your door you hop on them and start taking them with a grin on your face even thinking that hey i'm feeling some sort of difference little do you know what you've been pumping into your ass for the past eight weeks has been just an oil compound with no hormone in it and the changes you're seeing are nothing even outside of your just little conception of the world that you're in you think you're getting better but in fact you're just staying more of the same the only reason the scale has moved is because you just ate like a fat ass thinking that the anabolics were going to Get you to grow indefinitely this feeling sucks because not only are you out of money but you're also out of time our most precious resource now you could go on to complain to this source and, and tell them everything that they did wrong to you and they might even send you a another <laughs> cycle for free just to make men's meat and this turns out to also be fake it just gave him long enough to completely disappear from all contacts in the internet the better option is to tackle this by just simply owning up to the fact that you didn't do your research or your due diligence before buying something from a source that is supposedly supposed to be legible. There are sources left and right out there these days, and you do really have to be considerate before purchasing. By the way, our Discord is a really great place to access this. Tier 2 members know what I'm talking about. Now, I can't really help you on YouTube, but uh, I will help you by telling you that there is a lot of bullshit sources, and you will get screwed unless you're extremely careful and being extremely wise while you're surfing the internet. But once you do buy wise, it doesn't mean you will get results. Yeah, we have to dig a bit deeper into the monkey see, monkey do shit that you're doing at the gym. The amount of idiocy you see in public gyms is kind of almost overwhelming, sorry to say. Including myself. I mean, dude, I have cerebral palsy. Have you ever seen someone try to fucking squat four plates with cerebral palsy? It's hilarious. I mean, it's it's a spectacle. It really, it really is. <laughs> People really do have issues with training though, from the most extreme issues to the sometimes most mild of things missed that are limiting gains a huge amount. I'll touch on some of the basics, but I've made tons of videos on this stuff. You guys could just surf to get more detailed analysis here. But tracking loads in the gym is absolutely critical. If you just train what 
feels hard, you're likely not going to push yourself every session in the gym. I have seen people walk in and out of the gym for two years straight, putting the same weight on the bar every time, training that group with the same amount of repetitions. And it's certainly hard, but it isn't hard enough and they never actually make progress. But the people you see who are adding a weight, even just a kilogram per side or something like that, end up usually making a substantial amount of progress. If you're able to linearly get stronger over the largest time horizon, you're going to be wildly successful. But people fail because they don't challenge themselves to be stronger every session, adding on, like I said, even just a kilogram on the machine or on the bar. Also, technicality in the gym is another huge failing point. People like to move weight, but they don't actually consider what they're doing when they're moving weight or what the specific intention is behind moving that weight in that specific pattern. Now, I'm not saying you need to be an exercise scientist and go dig through all the literature to find what movements do what to get the best results or whatever. But what I am asking is for you to be a little bit more speculative while you train. Start asking, why am I doing this and where should I be feeling this specific movement on my own body? If you don't feel the appropriate tension, then move. <laughs> it's, it's really that simple. Start playing around with your body and find positions where you do feel appropriate tension within the given muscle that you're trying to target with that specific movement. And some people might say that feeling isn't everything, and I would absolutely agree, but it is a good proxy to where the tension is being applied in the muscle. And then one thing you could really do to level up your knowledge here is learn the insertion and attachment points of specific muscles you're trying to train and get to grow. Once you understand their insertions and attachments, you kind of understand how the fibers move on your body, and you can align that fiber movement with exercises that would be best for you. From there, then training as intensely as you can, getting to extremely close proximities to failure or even to failure with each movement that you do, making sure that you're accumulating at least six to eight sets per week on each of your body parts you're trying to grow, and then escalating those as you continue to train across a 12-week span or so. Sadly, though, even training great and real gear won't save you from a coach's worst nightmare. A bad diet will stop anybody in their tracks. You're going to need to eat a truly nutrient-rich diet. This will ensure that your body is pulling out all the stops it needs to get it to grow. The biggest cows, for example, in the world don't just eat grass all day. It's not just like the cattle that's sent to the butcher, and nor would you want to be the cattle that's sent to the butcher. You want to be that jacked cow that everyone kind of pictures in their mind when they think of like myostatin inhibition or whatever it was. I don't even know, allegedly. Uh, Consider what you're eating how it is fueling your body, and most importantly, how it makes you feel. You're sniffing, coughing, getting really bad lower abdominal bloat after a meal, or even getting really tired. These are pretty big red flags that what you're eating might not be that good for you. That doesn't mean that's not good for somebody else, but it just might not be well reactive for you. Likewise, you should know by now that if you're eating something that's in a package or isn't a single ingredient food, it's probably not the best option for you. Your best choice almost all of the time is to start with whole food like single ingredient foods and then mixing them up to make something beautiful, but doing it at home as opposed to out at the restaurants or out in the grocery store. And the if it fits your macros, people can scream all they fucking want, but success leaves clues. And if we look at all of the top Olympian bodybuilders, classic physique and open bodybuilding, who's doing if it fits your macros? Nobody, nobody placing in the top 10 is doing if it fits your macros, nor have they ever. I'll literally wait for you to find one. All right, now that I've pissed off a large majority of people, it's time to do it again. If you are too fucking fat, you are not going to grow muscle. Full stop. This pisses so many people off, but it's just, it's common sense. Get abs, get muscle definition, get separation between your muscles. Cutting before slapping tons of gear and food on you is critical. If you just push the gear when you're already overweight, and trust me, a lot of you think you're in shape and you're fat as hell, you're not going to even dream of growing, okay? This is an impossibility. Getting really lean gives you the benefit of insulin sensitivity and way less inflammation, which is a critical factor when trying to grow lean mass and prioritize the partitioning of the nutrients you're consuming into that lean mass. It also just provides a generally healthier environment. And who doesn't want that when you're already submitting yourself to something that is wildly unhealthy, which is an excessive use of performance enhancing drugs. Less adipokines, less inflammation, less triglycerides, less LDL and HDL particles. And it just can be seen in 
in the world we live in, in fitness. When people usually make the most amount of progress in their physiques and grow the most amount of muscle, they usually start pretty lean or at least really skinny. I have shown these examples many times before, but here is myself starting out at basically like 200 pounds, as lean as humanly possible with like zero fat on my body. Like my glutes are literally walnuts and I could feel my fingers go through the ripples in my glutes. The after effect, three months of time, I gained the most muscle I've ever gained in my entire life using the least amount of drugs I've ever had to use in my entire life. And seriously, I'm half as impressive as some of my clients or the other people out there in the space. I'm telling you this from experience, not just someone who's sitting on a chair behind an office that is, uh, you know, has no connection with the real world. I have had hundreds of clients and I can tell you with certainty that this will literally grow you. If you cut it all off and then start to add in things, you will be so much better off. Now, pooping might not be at the top of your list of things you think about each day, but it should be at least at least at the bottom. A funny joke, right? Honestly, though, people have wildly bad digestion. And I use the Bristol stool chart a lot here because it helps give people an objective viewpoint at where their digestion should be. If you aren't falling within the ranges of stool types three or four, you're kind of screwing the pooch, my friend. Also, you shouldn't have any undigested food in your stool. And if you have discolored stool by any means, if like it's not inherently that lightish brown hue, you are also in some pretty thick doo-doo. The last thing you're really wanting to consider is loading or indigestion, like uh, acid reflux or lower abdominal distension or something of that nature, pain in your abdomen wall after eating a meal. This is telling you directly that you cannot process the foods that you're eating and they're ultimately not going into the end fates of what they should to build your muscle. Hopefully not, because uh, you also need to consider sleep, the next thing that's really important here. And I don't know how well you could sleep effectively with feces on your feet, or, or should you, allegedly. Sleeping actually has to be one of the most critical things you can do to maximize your gains and minimize fat gain. Seriously, I think this is truly the pinnacle of what makes a cycle work extremely well. If you're training like an animal and then coming home and eating and sleeping like a newborn baby, you are on track, my friend. This literally means eating all the time, sleeping all the time, taking frequent naps, and generally sucking on something that resembles a breast. I don't know what I'm talking about. I haven't sucked a breast in years or ever. And the more slow wave sleep you get, the better you're going to partition nutrients in the favor of building muscle and mitigating fat gain. For example, there was a great study done on two groups. One of the groups was calorically restricted and they slept six or less hours a night. The other groups was calorically restricted and slept seven or more hours a night. They were both protein controlled and calorie controlled and both lost weight, just about the same amount of weight. But what was really interesting is the group that slept less actually lost more muscle mass than they did fat mass. Effectively, becoming fatter as they lost weight. Whereas the group that slept more mitigated this from happening and primarily gained muscle tissue and lost primarily fat mass. They still lost some muscle tissue, like 20%. But compared to the group that didn't sleep so well, which was like 60%, it was way more favorable. The same can be applied in reverse as well. If you're massing and taking lots of drugs to grow, sleeping seven plus hours a night could very well make sure that you're partitioning that mass amount of calories into muscle tissue and not partitioning it primarily into to fat. And so as you gain weight, you kind of leverage more muscle gain as the calories continue to rise. And the more partitioning into muscle just generally means the more muscle you'll have. Whoopee. But if you sleep less, you're going to be gaining more fat than you are muscle. And this will lead to some really big problems after a very short amount of time. This is an amazing effect when you have anabolic hormones in play as well, because there will be a massive synergy between all of these things, but especially sleep when you're trying to grow muscle. Look, this is coming from my heart of hearts. It isn't just the cycle that you're running that's going to net you progress. It's the things that you're doing on cycle that will net you progress. If you neglect the small details, you might as well just run a testosterone booster and instead because pinning your ass won't do a single good thing for you if you can't get your life straight. To be very clear, I don't believe like anybody has ever achieved anything extremely great without having sacrificed something equally as great. It's never easy and it's never always fun. It can be fun, but not always. But it's the journey that makes the man and not the destination. And if you neglect the journey, you get neither outcome. You don't get to the destination and you just become less of a man waiting there for your luck to start. If you found this video useful, consider subscribing and leaving a comment down below to tell me what you would like me to cover next. I will see you in the next one.